All right, anticonvulsants. So if you remember the beginning of the year, I had said that, you know, there were a couple sections in pharmacology that were truly, truly just like horrific. Um, I think it was, I said AIDS. I said cancer. Antibiotics gets better with time, but, you know, it can be tough to start. Anticonvulsants are the worst. They are, they are up there with cancer drugs. They are up there with the AIDS drugs when we get to them. Um, they're just a mess, and it just sucks. So what I'm going to say is I have a little chart. We're going to focus on the chart. Maybe not for the exam that you're going to take, but for step one, like this is, this is gold because they all sort of can have different indications and they are kind of indicated in different things. But the point is you have to know like the gold standard. Like if you have a patient who's having absence seizures, you give them ethosuximide. You don't keep reading the question. You give them ethosuximide. That's it. Uh, same with status. You have a patient with status, you give them benzo. So I'm not really going to focus as much on the indication. You got to know that these specific indications do exist. But what I'm going to say is you really want to focus on the side effects because that's where they get you. A lot of these drugs have side effects that are sort of unique, and that's how they're going to test you. And unfortunately, the I think the worst part about them is the mechanisms. We're not very elucidated. Some of them have two to three mechanisms each. And, you know, if they ask you about, you know, the mechanism of carbamazepine or whatever it is, you know, it, it, it just sucks because it's hard. It's hard. These drugs aren't really that well understood. So when it comes to mechanisms, so it's just it's just not fun. So we're going to get through this kicking and screaming. You're going to take it, and then you're never going to have to worry about it again until step comes. But, you know, cross that bridge when we come to it. So indications for anticonvulsant drugs. So we sort of break it down to the partial, tonic, clonic, absence, and status. Starting off with the easiest one, status. If you have a patient who comes in who's got seizure-like activity for five minutes or just seizure-like activity that does not rest, two or more, three or more, I'm going to give them a bit. So probably going to give them some Ativan. After a couple of trials of Ativan, you may give them some phenytoin. That's about it. Two, we'll do absence. So for an absence seizure, first line is ethosuximide. There's an interesting variant where it's an absence presenting with tonic-clonic where you would want to give valproic acid, but I don't think you're going to get tested on that. First line absence, ethosuximide. Now, tonic-clonic seizure. So those are our big guns. You're going to start off with phenytoin or valproic acid. There are a few second-line agents that you can use. Phenobarb, carbamazepine, topiramate, lamotrigine, and levetiracetam. Uh, what you will see going forward is, if you, when you do your neurology rotation, everyone will be on levetiracetam or Keppra because it, has, it is the most tolerated. And we'll talk about all of the side effects of these other drugs that have come before it. So even though when you take a test, you're thinking phenytoin or valproic acid, in real life, you'll see it's always Keppra or Lepiteracetum. Partial seizure. Partial seizure, first line is carbamazepine. After carbamazepine, you can give all of them except for ethosuximide. So know this chart. Know it. All right, so we'll start with phenytoin, the big, big, big gun. So phenytoin is... It's like warfarin, it's like methyltrexate, it is the slide that could have two slides, maybe three. So the mechanism that we are going to be talking about today is this prolongs sodium channel inactivation. So you want to think of it as a sodium channel inactivator. As we talked about, it is used for partial and tonic-clonic seizures. It is first line for tonic-clonic seizure, not used for absence. So pharmacokinetics, very, very, very important. Phenytoin is a very weird drug, and it's very hard to dose because it's biphasic. So if you guys remember way back to your couple pharmacokinetic lectures, 
it is first order and then it's zero order. So first order was the drug is, you know, it halves over a certain amount of time. So you have, let's say it's half-life is two hours. So you go from 20 to 10 to 5 to 2.5 over 2, 4, 6, 8 hours. That's first order kinetics. Unfortunately, zero order kinetics is when you start to just reduce the drug by a certain amount over time regardless of that. So you lose that half-life. So all of a sudden you, let's say, start just going in drug level minus two. So we'll say we're dosing you and a half-life goes by and we'll go back to the original example. It goes from 20 to 10, two hours. And then it goes from 10 to five and another two hours. But then it hits zero order kinetics. And then instead of going from 5 to 2.5, you go from 5 to 3, and then 3 to 1. And so you can see as you start dosing the patient for their next dose, if you're in those zero order kinetics, you are not going to be losing a, you're not going to be having that half life of the drug and the same anymore. So you give them another 20 they're now going to be at 23 and maybe they don't go from 23 to 11 they go from 23 to 21 because they're just you're in zero order kinetics so in those cases that's how we have like overdoses of phenytoin so it's very that's why we 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 do monitor levels because of this and uh, it can be tricky because at some point with your receptor saturation and your metabolism your body switches and you start having zero order kinetics and when that happens you know it becomes a little bit tougher to um to dose adjust so that's not like something that you'll commonly see in practice but it's more so like a nice kinetic vignette that they can test and you know they can start asking questions like the patient's overdosing on phenytoin or the levels went really high why did that happen it's because phenytoin is biphasic and it has first and zero order kinetics. Number two, phenytoin has a IV, an IM form called phosphenytoin. Pretty much it's a prodrug in, uh, that is able to be put in a solution and injected. So you just want to remember phenytoin is your oral agent and phosphenytoin is your uh, IV IM agent. Three, lots and lots of interactions. So one of the common things we'll talk about with kinetics is inhibitors and inducers. We've finally come to anticonvulsants, and we've talked about a few inducers. I believe we mentioned griseofulvin as an inducer of CYP enzymes, and we've talked about rifampin being an, inhib an inducer of the cytochrome P450 enzymes. Anticonvulsants are a major, huge, testable drug class that can cause induction of enzymes of the CYP450 system. So, oh, and we also talked about barbiturates as well. So, they induce the CYP enzymes, so therefore if you have a drug that's being metabolized through the CYP system, you have to worry about that drug levels dropping. In addition, the drug is very highly plasma protein bound. Therefore, if you have other drugs that are plasma protein bound, that you're taking like warfarin or NSAIDs, there could be a case where you're going to bump off one of those drugs or the drug itself won't be able to bump off and you'll have higher levels. In addition, I believe because of the induction of the cytochrome 450 system and the heavy amount of enterohepatic circulation that oral contraceptives go through, you can have a decrease in effectiveness of oral contraceptives when you take phenytoin. As I mentioned before, therapeutic levels. We monitor the blood levels of phenytoin because of the toxicities that you will see and the interactions that occur. Side effects. So very important to remember there are two types of side effects with phenytoin. There are the acute toxicities where you took 100 pills and then there's the chronic. I've been taking this drug for 20 years so now I am suffering from. Now acutely the biggest thing you want to remember is uh, a neurological 
side effects, and the biggest one you want to know is nystagmus. Nystagmus is, you know, horizontal nystagmus is a very big key tipping point if they give you a question stem to start thinking about anticonvulsant toxicity. It can also cause diplopia and ataxia, GI disturbances, confusion, and uh, cerebral atrophy. But think nystagmus. Chronically, chronically, uh, phenytoin side effects include gingival hyperplasia and hirsutism. Big, big, big side effects. If you have a patient for whatever, and you see gingival hyperplasia, circle phenytoin and move on. Hirsutism as well. Well, that can be a couple of other things too, but gingival hyperplasia and phenytoin are just a, just create that word association. Can also cause uh, vitamin D and vitamin K abnormalities, agranulocytosis. However, um, there's another drug we'll talk about that also causes agranulocytosis, and I want you to associate that anticonvulsant with it, not phenytoin. Uh, megaloblastic anemia and Hodgkin's like syndrome. So big side effects, acutely nystagmus, chronically gingival hyperplasia and hirsutism. Be used for partial tonic-clonic seizures. They are biphasic. That comes in IV and IM form and phosphenatoin. And then there are lots of interactions that you need to know. There's a lot of information about phenytoin and it's all very important for you to remember. Carbamazepine, another another very important drug. So again, we're going to say that this one prolongs the sodium channel refractory period. Its uses, first line for partial seizures. It can be used for tonic-clonic, but not absence. And also, for your information, maybe not for this exam, for future ones, if you see a patient who has trigeminal neuralgia, the um, lightly touching of the a mandible area of the face that causes, you know, shooting electric like pains, it's trigeminal neuralgia, you give carbamazepine. And it can also be used for bipolar. As we talked about with phenytoin, uh, carbamazepine is a, in the class of anticonvulsants, so it induces the CYP450 enzymes and it can cause a whole host of interactions. Just sort of included a list of other drugs that it can interact with. It metabolized into oxcarbamazepine, which is also another drug that is used for seizures. It is just a metabolite of uh, carbamazepine. It's the 10-11 epoxide metabolite. It's thought to be less potent, but as we'll talk about with some of the side effects of carbamazepine, it's got a bit of a better profile of toxicity. Some side effects. Acutely, it can cause stupor, coma, convulsions, irritability, and rash, a hypersensitivity. Chronically, though, we can also get diplopia and ataxia. Very important to side effects of carbamazepine, diplopia and ataxia. You can also see GI upset, unset stomach, and steadiness, drowsiness, and fluid retention. However, if you were in a crunch and I, you wanted to, you can only remember a few things about carbamazepine. I would say remember a plastic anemia and a granulocytosis. I said for phenytoin, because granulocytosis was also a side effect, don't, don't worry about phenytoin and a granulo. You want to remember carbamazepine and a granulo. I don't know why, but they associate carbamazepine with just a drop in granulocytes. So a granulocytosis, carbamazepine. And then finally, your third fact, if you only wanted to remember three, Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Now, I know I keep doing this, but remember way back when we talked about pharmacogenetics and genomics and all that crap, and, you know, the lecture was led, and they said this was going to change the world because we're going to figure out the perfect drug and yada, 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 and test everybody. Well, this is actually one of those cases where it, we can test you. So if you are HLAB1502, you are extremely highly likely to have Stevens-Johnson syndrome if you take carbamazepine, so you shouldn't take it. So there are two instances in pharmacology where you're going to have to remember something like this. This is one of them. If you see HLAB 15002, I want you to know 
no carbamazepine because of Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Uh, there's another instance with an, uh, an HIV drug where something similar occurs, and we'll go over that when that comes. But I can tell you, if you see HLA-B2-1502 and the patient has a rash, circle carbamazepine, circle Stevens-Johnson syndrome, move on. Like, very, very easy question if you just remember that point. Ah, no. Valproic acid, valproate, and Depakote. Now, this isn't really a brand or generic thing. Providers... They just, they just refer to valproic acid as all three of these things. So now I know I've told, talked about brand name drugs and you're not expected to know the brand names of drugs. I would say like if you had to know one, I would know this because just people people just interchangeably talk about valproic acid all the time. They say Depakote, they say valproate, and they say valproic acid. And honestly, even on a question stem, I could see her using any one of these names because it's just, it, I don't know why it's just so interchangeable. People use this all the time. So know that. This is one of our mean drugs of anticonvulsant drugs where, you know, it inhibits the sodium channels and the T-type calcium 2 channels and the CABA channels. And it also is a little stimulating of uh, the GAD, which works in GABA synthesis. So this would specifically be an instance where I would tell you that I don't think they're going to ask you about mechanism of action for valproic acid, and you can sort of see why. How are you going to ask a question? You know, what receptor does valproic acid work on? Like, you couldn't ask that question. Uses. Well, if they, and if they did, they'd be kind of mean, but, you know, whatever. Uses. Partial seizures, absence seizures, and tonic-clonic seizures. However, as I said before, Ethosuximide is your first line agent. So even though it can be used for absence, ethosuximide. So, and as I just said, valproate is better when patients with absence are turning into tonic clonic seizures, not just standard absence. But I I just don't think they're gonna get into that depth with you guys. This is another drug where we monitor blood levels, and there are a few pharmacokinetic things we do need to know. It's metabolized via the liver. It's very, very highly pro plasma protein bound. And it, it can inhibit the metabolism of phenytoin, carbamazepine, and uh, phenobarbital. Because this is more of a SIP inhibitor than it is an inducer, even though it's an anticonvulsant. Side effects, nausea, vomiting, weight gain, GI upset, sedation, hepatotoxicity. Uh, it's rare, but it can occur. And then finally, the big, big thing you want to know with valproic acid is spina bifida, congenital defects. It can also cause cardiovascular, facial, and digital defects, but they're going to ask you about spina bifida. And how do we prevent it? These patients have to, I don't remember the dose, I apologize, but there is a standard dose that all pregnant, all females who are considering becoming pregnant should be on. And then there is the dose of those who are on folic acid. They need to be on a higher dose. Ethosuximide. Already talked about it quite a bit. This is a T-type calcium channel inhibitor. This is first line in absence. And it can cause a rash and bone marrow depletion or neutropenia. Ethosuximide. Ah, first line absence. With heavy side effects. Bone marrow depletion. Benzos and barbiturates. So we've already talked about these, so I really won't go into too much detail. So phenobarb, as we've talked about it before, it is a GABA-A receptor agonist, which increases the duration in which the channel is open, but it also works on inactivating voltage-gated sodium channels and AMP. It's an AMP antagonist. So as I said before, you know, it's tough to be asked a question about mechanism of action when you have three different possible mechanisms of action. And these are used for partial and tonic-clonic seizures, not absence, and then it can also be used in young kids with status. So typically status is treated with a benzo, however in, in young kids it can't be used. Uh, this is another medication where we monitor blood levels. Uh, some side effects include sedation, ataxia, nystagmus, Big things we've already talked about, respiratory depression, rash, and um, this is more of a biochem 
kind of throw up. It can cause exacerbation of porphyrias. Uh, and then there is tolerance, and eventually because of tolerance, you could become toxic as you increase levels. Uh, different benzodiazepine, these are GABA-A receptor modulators, increasing the frequency of the glory channel opening. Obviously, we know the side effects, sedation, tolerance, withdrawal, addiction. We have two, we have diazepam, which can be used for status in this case, and then clonazepam, which can be used for absence. But, you know, as I've made the point quite clear, for absence seizure, you do want to use ethosuximide. And then even though they do say diazepam is used for status, what you'll typically see is uh, Ativan or lorazepam. And then I've just included the barbiturate slide from the previous lecture for your information and the benzodiazepine slide for your information. Okay, complementary agents. And so this is where it really gets tricky because you have all these newer agents that have been developed that can be used, uh, and it it's just not very clear. So again, in this case, we're going to talk about the mechanism. We're going to, sorry, we're going to talk about the side effects, and that's how we're going to really be able to differentiate some of these drugs. Lamotrigine. For lamotrigine, think rash. Associate lamotrigine with a bad rash. So this is an inhibitor of sodium and some calcium channels. It can be used as an adjunct in refractory patients, specifically patient tonic clonic kids that are greater than two years old. But you know, forget about all that and just remember lamotrigine gives you a rash. Felbamate. Felbamate is a very new drug. It really isn't used quite often. Uh, the mechanism, possibly a GABA-A modulator, possibly an NMDA blocker, but in this case we're not quite sure how it works. The uses, uncontrolled partials, adjunct to tonic, clonic, and partials. So this is sort of, you know, if, if you need to put them on something else for a little bit better control, you can use it. Big things you want to think about are aplastic anemia and uh, severe hepatitis. And again, as I put on the bottom, only in refractory cases. So this really is a patient. This really is a drug to be used in a patient who, you know, is uh, isn't responding to a lot of different drugs, and you've sort of made it far down the list. All right, gabapentin and pregabalin. So very similar drugs. Uh, it's a GABA analog, but it works by inhibiting the voltage-gated calcium channels. These are used as adjunct to partial seizures, and they can be used for neuropathic pain. So specifically for gabapentin, it exacerbates uh, myoclonic seizures. So wouldn't want to use it in a myoclonic seizure patient. Side effects include somnolence, uh, dizziness, and ataxia. Fun fact, its brand name is Neurontin, but people call it Morontin because it kind of makes you just... I don't want to say makes you stupid, but it sort of gives you like a cloudy brain. So they don't like, patients don't like taking it because it makes them kind of feel cloudy. And uh, another thing is it is renally excreted. So patients who you know, have poor renal function need to worry about it. It's built up. Gabapen, pregabalin, very similarly, uh, can be used for neuropathic pain. When the drug, so gabapentin came out first and then pregabalin came out years later, for whatever reason, when they were studying pregabalin, they decided to ask on the clinical trial questionnaire, yada, 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 do, they, do patients like taking the drug? And they found that patients did indeed like taking the drug. Uh, you know, so, and they sort of attributed this idea that they did like taking the drug to possible possibilities of um, abuse. Because of that, uh, pregabalin is a controlled substance and gabapentin is not, even though they are very, very similar. And, you know, as I'm sure some of you might already know, there is there are reports of patients taking extremely high doses of gabapentin to um, either facilitate a high to help ease withdrawal symptoms and um, to actually use as an adjunct if you were using an opioid to get a stronger high. So these are being abused more and more. Topiramate and Keppra or Levetiracetam. Now these two you will see quite a bit. 
topiramate, prolonged sodium channel refractory period, AMP antagonism, and at this point I've sort of given up because, you know, at this there's just too many. We don't really know how topiramate works either. And because it's got so many of these weird mechanisms, we find that it works for quite a bit. So it can be used as an adjunct for tonic, clonic, and partial seizures. However, where you're going to really see it is it can be used for headaches and migraines, chronic prophylaxis. It can also be used for eating disorders and many different things. So the pyramid is kind of like one of those funky drugs that works on a lot of different things. Side effects, somnolence, fatigue and dizziness, cognitive slowing. So as I talked about for gabapentin and its neurontin being morontin, you have topiramate is topamax. Some people call this one dopamax because it does, you know, I had a friend who took it and uh, for migraines and, and she specifically said that when she started taking it, she couldn't, she couldn't remember. She would be in the middle of a sentence and she would forget the word that she was about to say. And that's sort of like this common side effects of, some side effect of topiramate is word finding difficulties. It can also help for weight loss, and so therefore, in that case, it's a good thing when using it for uh, uh, weight loss. Levetiracetum. So, this is an adjunct for tonic, clonic, or partial, but it's actually kind of used first line. Very safe drug, very little effect. Some, the biggest thing is some, some mood changes, but for the most part, very benign, and it's used quite commonly because of that. All right, so I know that was a lot. We made it through quite a bit, and it's it's very difficult. This the anticonvulsants are are tough, and you know you're not really going to see them again. So it's one of those if you don't use it, you lose it. I'm sure you don't really remember a lot about the cancer drugs. I could tell you I don't, and I need to restudy them from time to time because it's just very hard to keep in your head. So. I would advise you to know this chart, have an idea of this chart, to really just go over the side effects as much as you can. Maybe make a chart for some of the side effects because that's where they're going to test you. And really just, you know, make an Anki deck, Quizlet, whatever you guys do to try to memorize things. Just try to, to start getting these funky names and side effects in your head because it's difficult and there's a lot of information I know and it sucks. Finish with a quick question. Five-year-old boy brought to the emergency department for recurrent general tonic-clonic seizures over the past 24 hours. He's been having high fever and flu-like symptoms for the past three days. Past medical history includes febrile seizure, seizures at age of six months. He takes no medication, no family history of epilepsy. His temperature is 103, BP is 110 over 70, pulse is 112, respirations are 10. He appears lethargic, does not fumble, simple commands. His neck is supple. During examination, the patient suddenly develops sustained generalized tonic-clonic convulsions without fully regaining consciousness between episodes. Status. Which of the following describes the me mechanism of action of the most appropriate initial therapy for his seizures? So, he's uh, in status. What is the most appropriate initial therapy for his seizures? If you picked C, you are correct. Postsynaptic chloride, uh, chloride influx being our benzos and barbiturates would be the way to go for this patient. Status, you want to use a benzo.